As I uh, had become a millionaire, I knew that I could become a multi-multi-millionaire. Enough was never enough. The Copper King back in its heyday, it was a big deal. This is where you wanted to be seen because it was the place. I was uh, born and raised in Butte. Uh, I grew up over on the corner of Harvard and Farragut. Uh, really lived there all of my growing up years. Uh, my mom came out of the Virginia City area and my dad really came from the mining and uh, really a, a Butte person in and out uh, in every single way. This was obviously a very heavy union town. Uh, it seemed like uh, during most of the growing up years that the miners were on strike or that they uh, were getting ready to go on strike. So there were those, those were the two options. Uh, and that obviously affected the income in our families quite a bit. Uh, there weren't a lot of extras in our family that we had. We had uh, great family love and a great family time, but uh, I didn't spend a lot of money doing other things. As I got out of high school, I. I was able to get on at the, uh, with the mining operation with Anaconda Company at the Berkeley Pit. Uh, started in the crusher, which was uh, probably the dirtiest and hardest job that I've ever had. I'd really made a decision that I wasn't going to go to college. I would uh, uh, continue to work at the Anaconda Company, and I told my mom and dad that I was just going to stay on and work in the, in the pit, and uh, my dad literally uh, uh, I, and I've never seen my dad really that way, but he literally got my stuff and uh, threw it out the yard, threw it out the door, and he said, no son of mine's going to be a miner, and, and he, he felt very strongly. He worked in the mines, and, and uh, he just wasn't going to have one of his kids do that, and, and, uh, and that was really the day that I picked up my stuff and uh, said, uh, I, I was just kidding, I'm really not going to work in the mines, and, and made a decision to go back to school. I uh, went from there to uh, Bozeman and Montana State University and uh, got my degree in architecture. Money was uh, something that I really yearned for. Uh, my goal was uh, to be a millionaire and my goal was to do that by the time I was 30 years old. And so I really had kind of one direction and one thing that was important in life and that's what I pursued. In 1972, Daniel Cook started his construction company. Renovating houses evolved into renovating commercial buildings, which eventually led to his desire to open a major hotel in Butte. I decided in uh, about 1978 to uh, try and develop a hotel in Butte. From the beginning, we wanted it to, to have a class and be nicer than anything else in town. Uh, we really wanted to be nicer than anything else in the state. So we looked for land, we knew we needed about 10 acres and uh, found a uh, drive-in theater that was owned by the Carish Group. Uh, contacted them and found out they in indeed wanted to sell that and so we made, we made an offer of uh, $350,000 and uh, bought this drive-in theater. The Copper King Inn was uh, by far the most exciting project that we had done up to that time in my life. We watched it start to change a city quite a bit. Butte started to have some revival in the early 80s. Uh, I think the Copper King played a uh, fairly significant role in that. The Copper King back in its heyday was a place where people in the community would gather. It was the place where weddings happened and where people convened and it was upbeat and it was happy and it was just that hub of activity. We uh, became the convention center in the state. We literally uh, had conventions every single week. And then of course in the summertime, there was always a lot of traffic from Yellowstone Park to Glacier. So the Copper King became very successful and it did it uh, at, at a very low rate. Uh, we opened up the Copper King at $18 a night. And we were worried at the time if anybody would pay $18 to come to a hotel. It was just, thousands of people through this hotel and it was fast-paced it was hustle and bustle all hands on deck the copper king had sort of a core staff and we really took an ownership we took such pride in taking care of our facility and the guests and each other it was our business it was a business that ran 24 hours a day seven days a week a lot of famous people have stayed here uh, uh, people uh, they've made movies here uh, over the years in butte and 
Of course, all the actors all stayed at the Copper King Inn when they came out here. Um, and this lady comes in and she said, that gentleman looks so familiar. He just picked up my luggage and started carrying it. Who is he? And I grabbed a big black Sharpie and I said, that's John Boyd, go have him sign your luggage. Probably the one that strikes in my mind the most is Evil Knievel. When he came to town, I'd get a call from the manager and he said, Evil's in town, uh, you better come down. There were times when this facility just housed amazing people. We were very protective of them. We didn't want anyone to know who was here. We'd get the phone calls and nope, they're not staying here. The Copper King breathed new life and energy into Butte. It was the only facility of its kind in Montana and proved to be very lucrative for Dan and his partners. We quickly found that gambling was very, very profitable uh, and uh, opened up more bars and more casinos around the state. Gambling has uh, uh, kind of an interesting history in Montana. Uh, I think that uh, the fear from the beginning is that the mafia uh, type people would uh, come into that particular business and so one day uh, I was sitting in my office and a couple of men came in and uh, kind of uh, really almost forced their way into my own personal office and they let me know that they were my new partners in our gambling operation and and I let them know that I really didn't need any partners and I didn't want any partners uh, they uh, uh, showed me pictures of my family and the house I lived, and uh, it was uh, it was a difficult time. Uh, it's not one of the things I'm proud of. Uh, we became partners with people that uh, I really didn't care for too much, although as time went on, uh, uh, sometimes being captive of someone gets better, and, and uh, we started to uh, enjoy some of that relationship that they brought to the table. In those days, uh, life had become kind of difficult for me. I, uh, I was going through all the family problems, uh, and in some ways, I didn't care too much about life anymore. I drove a uh, 280Z uh, a car that uh, had the ability to go about as fast as you could go, and I would come back and forth to Montana most weekends and see my kids, and, and I had started trying to uh, beat my time. I, I was playing time games in my car, and I was uh, drinking a fair amount of beer on the way. I didn't care about a lot of things at that point. Uh, I had developed this uh, money that was important to me, and I was starting to see uh, problems within some of that. Some of those things that were really producing significant money started to stop. Several different things were happening in the hotel up here. They had changed the drinking age to 21. Uh, there were fires in Yellowstone Park and it stopped all of the uh, uh, tourist traffic one year, which was really incredibly important to the success of the hotel. And, uh, we had uh, a number of, uh, of problems happen within our bars and they became uncontrollable. and. Uh, I had uh, four different lawsuits, uh, then we had a major construction accident, and I literally started selling assets, uh, and I uh, sold literally everything we owned, and I had lost everything, uh, had lost all the glamour, had lost everything that I ever worked for, everything I ever cared about. Over the years, the Copper King was owned by multiple owners, some more passionate than others, um, and you can definitely tell who was passionate, because you would see the work being done within the facility. When I was here in the early 1990s, Jeff Jonas, he was a gentleman out of Utah, owned the facility, and he was the gentleman who actually built the dome. And it was a cool facility, but we're in Montana, and it's just a big bubble. And so as time went on, we knew that that really, it changed how things happened here. I really felt that the dome being put up started to set the Copper King back. The 24,000 square foot dome proved very expensive to run and maintain, and eventually became a major drain on the hotel. Over the years, uh, I had kept track of the Copper King Inn. I watched it go through, uh, I think, three or maybe four owners. Uh, they never did anything to it. They let it run down. Uh, I literally never even changed the furniture in the rooms over a 35-year uh, period of time. When the facility closed, it was really hard to think that the facility would ever close. 
through all the years that I've been in this industry, you just always felt that the bank would keep it running or someone would keep it running. And when it closed, it caused, it was a deficit in this community. We didn't have our large convention facility. It took us off the map for those big, big conventions. I feel like we just quit existing. We just stopped existing. The costly expense of the dome, owners who were emotionally and financially uninvested, and economic changes eventually forced the Copper King to close its doors permanently. Bankrupt and abandoned, the once grand hotel forgotten. I became involved in the renovation through a uh, local realtor and he asked me if I was interested in the Copper King and at that time I immediately responded that I didn't need another job and I was not interested in the Copper King and uh, my next response was how much are they selling it for? I came over, viewed the property and it was in bankruptcy at the time. The courts were responsible for the uh, liquidation of the asset. The Copper King Hotel had been empty for nearly two years. In October of 2015, Matt Nissler and Rex Leipheimer decided to make an offer on the abandoned hotel. So the bankruptcy judge approved our bid and then we owned this big albatross, this huge building that was closed for the last two years. And so we took our ideas and threw them in a big pot and tried to figure out what exactly we were going to do with this facility. And we pondered multiple different things. We were hit from the community on a lot of different levels. What can you do with this facility? Can we turn it into the homeless shelter was one of the ideas. Can you turn it into the veterans home was one of the ideas. We initially bought it because we're into multifamily apartment projects and we felt, you know, this would be a possibility of turning into apartments. It's 122,000 square feet under a roof, you know. Uh, people need housing. So uh, through the process, I had gotten a five-gallon bucket full of blueprints, literally, uh, well, two five-gallon buckets full of blueprints. And so I, I opened up these blueprints and I noticed that the architect that originally drew these plans back in 1978-79 was a fellow by the name of Dan Cook. After my bankruptcy, as I reopened my architectural firm and our construction company, I found the, the true source of what I was looking for, and that was God, and, and God became my savior. And I knew that I could start fresh, do things very, very differently. It was a new beginning, and uh, God really spoke to me in my heart and really showed me that I needed to concentrate on doing just uh, Christian buildings. Uh, one of the uh, true disappointments in my life was watching this building close. And I had kind of dreamed about what I'd do with it if I ever had another possibility, but at the same time, there were too many memories. I didn't want to get into uh, the hotel business again or the bar business or any of that again. And I assumed that I could get digital drawings for these plans so that then I could mold it into whatever product that I wanted to. I found this Daniel Cook down in Ogden, Utah, and on the outside chance that it was the very same Daniel Cook, I phoned him and talked to his secretary, and I could tell it was a big firm just by what I had found online, and so I figured the guy probably wasn't even going to call me back. And out of the blue one day, I got a call from uh, Matt Nissler. Fifteen minutes later, I get a call from Daniel Cook. He asked me if I had the plans for the building, and I said, uh, yes, I do. And he said, well, what would I have to do to get a hold of them? And I said, I'd be happy to, to send them to you. What are you doing? And, and he said, well, I think we're going to make it into housing and kind of haven't decided completely. And I said, gosh, I, I don't think I'd do that. Dan says, this is what I think I'd do with that property. I'd turn it, I'd keep it as a hotel. It was always a wonderful hotel. It's, it's the throbbing heart of Butte as far as a convention space, as far as an event space, and it feeds the community. It draws these people from around the state to this central location in Montana that creates this wonderful opportunity for economic growth and for community development. And so Matt flew down to Ogden, uh, came down and, and met us. Uh, we spent the day together. Uh, kind of brainstormed uh, what it is that you could possibly do at the hotel, and I said, I 
I think it realistically could be the best hotel in, in Butte again. Uh, frankly, I think it could be the best convention center in the state again. It was perfect, and it took a while uh, in the development stage to really get it to the stage that we, we brought it to today, but Dan already had it in his mind on how the outside was going to look. He had renderings, he drew it up, um, and, and showed us the day that we went down and met with him. He, was, he had uh, uh, quite a bit of legwork done before we showed up. We uh, actually had a market study done to see what the market was like for hotels. It came back very, very positive. And uh, Matt hired us to uh, redo the plans and to come up with new concepts and show them what we would do if we got a chance to do a do-over. I was blown away. Um, I was blown away that he had so much commitment to this property and this project. Um, before we had even secured his services, before we entered into a contract with him. When Matt and Rex came to the Chamber of Commerce, and I had never met them before, they brought the blueprints, I was introduced to them, and I was nervous. I was thinking, okay, another reopening of the Copper King, how are they going to do this? Is it going to work? I had no idea the changes that they were going to make. Matt asked me uh, what things I would do different, and uh, I said, uh, without any hesitation, I said, well, I sure, certainly wouldn't put a bar in there. And, uh, and I wouldn't be in the uh, gambling business. And, and I wouldn't be in the restaurant business. It's a tough business. I said, I'd find a tenant that really knew what they were doing. Uh, and they could provide the food. They could also provide the food to the convention center. And, and you could concentrate on just running the hotel. And, and if I was going to do it again, that's how I would do that. Uh, Matt talked to uh, many different uh, people about that, uh, different people that were in the restaurant business, and then came up one day and he said, I've got the opportunity to have the uh, Rib and Chop House out of Livingston. When Rex brought the project to me, I thought that uh, it was going to work very well. So when we first saw the space, a little shocking, don't get me wrong, and Matt promised that, uh, you know, with his eye, he would make this a beautiful restaurant, and he did. To have the Rib and Chop House here, is just taking Butte to the next level. It's taking the Copper King to where their convention food, their banquet food is gonna be top notch. We serve great steaks, fresh seafood, Cajun uh, entrees, and I think we bring a reputation that we've uh, been very fortunate to gain in the state of Montana. We feel that anybody can come in at any time and feel extremely welcome. To me, um, Butte is has the history, has the people, has uh, everything that we need to be successful. I think Matt's done a fantastic job and, um, and uh, very proud to be part of it. I said to Matt when I saw him, I grabbed him by the shoulders and I said, are you proud of yourself? Are you proud of what you've done? They have truly taken Butte to the next level. I never thought in my wildest dreams this facility could be as beautiful as it is right now. Every inch of the Copper King was recreated to the highest standards. And, once again, the hotel is able to boast a convention space unlike any other in the state of Montana. We've got a, uh, a full video wall that uh, is 24 foot wide and 16 foot high. We've got LED screens, we've got line array speakers. Lighting systems that each individual light can have 14,000 different uh, color variations. This facility is unequaled in its technology, in its convention space in the state of Montana. When you're in the hotel business, you have the opportunity to just be a part of something large. And that's what's great about the Copper King coming back. We're gonna be back doing big things. I am so proud of Matt and Rex with what they have done with this facility. It's just inviting and it's warm and it's just what you would expect for a hotel in Butte, Montana. Butte uh, is sometimes called Butte America. People would say it's the uh, only island in the world surrounded by land, and you'll find a friendliness here that is like any other. Today, when I walked into this facility and saw what it was, it brought uh, some tears to my eyes. 
to be able to come back to my hometown, to be able to come back to Butte, to be able to uh, uh, watch this building uh, get to be new again, uh, very much like watching myself become a new person. I got to start all over. I got to be able to do things differently. To see a building that we did uh, now 38 years ago uh, come back to life, to an architect, to a developer, to the owner of this building originally, uh, that's exciting. <laughs>